Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank Gaurav Singhal and uh, Phil Stevens for welcoming us to Foundation Medicine Offices. Costa, thank you for organizing this beautiful event and for the amazing collaboration in such a short time with me and with TripAdvisor. I think we did it like in two weeks, something like that. Thank you, Gregory, also. <laughs> um, I wish for many more professional and social collaborations with Foundation Medicine as a genomic person. Uh, thank you. And I would like to invite Gaurav, VP of Data Strategy and Product Development, to introduce us to Foundation Medicine. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ila, and thanks for uh, bringing all these people together. Um, so who besides Ila is a genomics person? All right, we've got a couple in the audience. Um, how many of you have heard of Foundation Medicine before or, or know what we do? Okay, a couple of people, so Costa, you don't count. Um, so I'll give you just a very you know, two-minute overview of Foundation Medicine, what we do, and I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about why data is so important to us um, and why we're so excited to host all of you in, in this event. Uh, so uh, as, a, as a company, it's hard to describe in, in sort of a short sentence what we do, but we sort of landed on this phrase that we are a molecular insights company, and our goal is to transform cancer care, and you've probably seen that around the building in a few different places. Um, fundamentally, what we do is we have uh, a bunch of uh, really sophisticated laboratory spaces upstairs that some of you may have seen or, uh, or probably can take a tour of if, if Costa is willing to take some people up there. Um, uh, but basically, we get samples of patients' tumors from all over the country, in fact, all over the world. Um, we process those samples through our laboratory upstairs. We extract the DNA. Um, and ultimately, our, our job and what we try to do is we try to identify um, through sequencing if there's any mutations uh, in that patient's cancer DNA that might be driving the growth of that tumor. And the reason we do this is that more and more over the last uh, several years now, it's become clear that if you know what mutations are responsible for a particular tumor, you have a better shot in many cases of treating that, that cancer in a more targeted and, uh, and precise way. So um, we do a lot of work, obviously, with, with physicians and patients uh, in, in the course of this work. We also work a lot with pharma companies that are developing new drugs um, for patients. And um, we see both of those as really important halves of what we do and, uh, and, and how we can improve um, the treatment of cancer for everyone. So just to give you a sense of, of why this is an important problem, um, there's 4 million cancer patients globally that have uh, advanced disease um, who, uh, who uh, might benefit from a test like the, the one that we do, and only a very small fraction of those patients get sequenced. In fact, when we started as a company five or six years ago, um, the work that we were doing had been established in research environments like the Broad, um, but was not really available for clinical care in, in many settings. And, and part of what we've done here is we've tried to make that that same standard of care that you might see at a big academic medical center like the Dana-Farber or Memorial Sloan Kettering and make that possible for any cancer patient, whether they're being treated at a big hospital, a small hospital, uh, a community uh, clinic, um, really anywhere. An interesting thing has happened as we've done this. So, so we started doing this in uh, 2012, I believe is when we sequenced our first patients. Uh, Darone in the back, I think, was personally responsible for, uh, for a lot of that work. Um, and over the course of the last five years, we have sequenced more and more patients every single year, um, to the point now where we've sequenced 140,000 patients of all kinds of different cancers from every corner of the globe. And what's amazing about that is if you took every single major academic medical center in the world and you added up all the sequencing they've done, it would still be a smaller number than what we've done in one lab here, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. So as many of you probably think about a lot of the problems with um, with, with data science, machine learning, et cetera, often it's just getting the data, and, uh, and often it's harmonizing data across multiple sources, and um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the amazing things about um, having a central facility is all of the samples live in one place, and all the analyses live in one place. And we have done a, a fair amount of work over the last several years in trying to turn that information into uh, discoveries and advancements for the field. Um, I think we've published over 250 um, articles or abstracts and, and presentations at conferences, um, including some, some really amazing discoveries by, um, by the scientists here. So just to give you an example of the type of work that we've done, these are a few different um, uh, paper headlines from folks here at Foundation Medicine, um, all just in one part of, of oncology, trying to uncover um, mechanisms of resistance. And a lot of this work was done just from the 140,000 now plus genomic samples that we have here. 
and the amount of information there is actually pretty impressive. So these are um, these are sequenced uh, at the at the DNA sort of base pair level. For those of you who remember your high school biology, um, across almost 400 genes, um, most of the genes that are believed to be um, cancer causing, and and all of that sequencing data at the raw level lived in some shape or form um, at Foundation Medicine. So there's a lot of interesting questions that we've asked here. You know, we, this is the beginning of the data story, but there's a lot more to the data story, like um, how do we discover new resistance mutations? How do we learn from real-world experiences and not from just from clinical trials? Um, and part of the work that we've done there is actually bring in, um, alongside these genomic data, um, we, we have integrated that with longitudinal clinical data. So it's really important to know that a patient has a mutation in gene X, but it's even more interesting from a data science perspective to know that that patient got drug Y and either that drug worked or it didn't work, right? Because then you can start to figure out which drugs work for which patients and which ones don't. And uh, you can imagine if, if this plays out the way many of us hope it does, um, you start to make sure that each patient gets the right drug um, so, that, uh, so that they're not wasting time and toxicity and other things with, with drugs that won't work and they're getting on the right medicine faster and more effectively. Um, so this is just a snapshot of some of the type of work we do here. I won't obviously go into this in detail, um, but, but in linking this clinical data with genomic data, we now have uh, over 20,000 records that have um, longitudinal clinical histories, the drugs that they received, other characteristics of their clinical care, and then associated with that, we have tremendously deep genomic data. Um, and candidly, we are at the tip of the iceberg of what could be done with, with this type of a data set. Um, we've uh, published a couple things. This was a poster from um, a conference called ASCO, or the American Society of Clinical Oncology, um, and, uh, and, and we shared some of our work uh, there, and, and that'll be written up as a manuscript. Um, but honestly, I think one of the future directions for this company is um, an area that we haven't really spent much time on, which is the, the field that all of you are, are so well versed in. Um, in fact, I would say that the field in general has not, it has sort of been solving the low-hanging fruit problems to date, and the role that machine learning will play, and Eli can probably speak to this in much more depth when, when she talks, um, is something that I think is an opportunity here and, and an untapped opportunity. So um, hopefully as, as you continue to develop the great work that you're doing, um, hopefully some of you will find a way to apply it in oncology and, and in genomics. So um, I won't belabor this. This was uh, um, some of the work that our CSO, Phil Stevens, um, led along with, uh, with some of the folks in this room um, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us. Um, so I'll just summarize this for you. Some of the work that, that he and his team led have led to the discovery of um, new biomarkers in a class of medicines called immunotherapies, which some of you may know about. Um, I'll just give you the, ba the, the basic importance of it, just to give you a framing for the types of problems that we're thinking about. Um, so in the last several years, a new class of therapies called immunotherapies have, have emerged in significance in the treatment of cancer. And what's amazing about these drugs is um, they, have the pos they have the potential to actually cure cancer. Many drugs that we give patients with cancer um, extend life or help with symptomatic control or prolong the progression of disease, but, but there's only a, a smaller set of drugs that actually cure disease. Now, the problem is they don't cure disease in everybody, and they cure disease roughly depends on the disease, but call it 20% of cancer patients. So the hard part is if you don't know which 20% it is, then you probably want to give it to everyone because everybody deserves a shot. But by giving it to someone who isn't going to respond to it, you're also costing them time to get a different drug that might work for them, right, if this one isn't going to work. So we've helped actually develop some of the biomarkers that have helped stratify or predict which of the 20 which of the sort of 100% will respond, but it's not perfect. As you can imagine a world in which if, you, if you're positive for this, you know, signal, then you've got a 25% or 30% chance of responding. But if you're negative, you still have a 10% chance of responding. So do you not give it to the people who are negative if it's only a 10% chance, right? It's a, hard, it's a hard question to answer. So part of the work that was done here was mining a data set like this and other data sets in collaboration with academic centers. Um, we showed that if you add some of the genomic findings into the, um, into the biomarker, you get better stratification, right? You take some of the responders from the biomarker low group and you pull them out into the responder group and vice versa. Um, and you start to get better and better sort of discrimination, right, of your responders and non-responders. So that work is, it, it, there's much work to be done there, but you can imagine a world if we could solve that problem, we could prevent the patients who don't need this drug and aren't going to benefit from getting it and suffering the toxicities and, and the time and everything else. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a really uh, exciting and, and ambitious goal. So anyway, I'll leave you with that. Thank you for, uh, for coming. Um, thank you, uh, Eli and others, for organizing. And I uh, hope you guys come back and visit us again.
Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Great. Very good. Excellent. All right. Uh, my name is Greg Amos. Um, first, I just want to uh, thank you, Ayla, for um, organizing this and uh, Foundation Medicine for, uh, for hosting the event. Um, uh, I think uh, it's uh, really fun to get a chance to um, compare notes about uh, how we've been using uh, deep learning and um, uh, machine learning in general. Um, so I'm not going to talk about cancer or genomics today. I'm going to talk about travel photos, so it's a little bit more uh, uh, light. Um, so specifically, I'm going to talk about how we've been using uh, deep learning to help improve our uh, photo selection on TripAdvisor. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing applied machine learning for quite a while now, but I'm relatively new to uh, machine vision. Um, so I've been on the TripAdvisor machine learning team for about three years now. This is our in-house logo, which I love a lot. Um, so yeah, I've been doing machine vision uh, for uh, only you know a couple of months now. Uh, before then, I was doing a lot of text processing and metadata processing around uh, reviews, finding uh, reviews that are not family friendly, uh, finding reviews that are fraudulent, that kind of thing. Uh, prior to that, I was in the military industrial complex uh, doing uh, adaptive radar jamming for uh, fighter jets. Lots of fun, but I'm kind of glad to find people a, a good vacation now. <laughs> and uh, prior to that, I was uh, getting my PhD at uh, BU, um, building uh, mathematical models of brain function and seeing how we can apply some of those models to uh, technical architectures to solve uh, engineering problems. Um, so in, in a lot of my background, I've been doing a lot of online learning, a lot of semi-supervised learning, not a lot of machine vision. Um, so this was kind of new to me. Um, about TripAdvisor, we're the largest travel website. Um, we have a lot of data and a lot of users, which is, uh, which is really fun uh, as, a, as a data scientist and machine learning person. Uh, you know, at, at any given month, we have nearly uh, half a billion unique visitors. Uh, we have about 150 million photos to play with. Um, uh, what is that, about half a billion reviews and opinions. Uh, we have a lot of data, uh, a lot of users, uh, which is great because we can uh, find that data. When we put things into production, we can uh, find out uh, what the impact is uh, relatively quickly. Um, so we do all this with about 400 engineers. Of those, maybe 40 are data scientists and machine learning engineers. Uh, the rest are, you know, web and database people. So um, we recently redesigned TripAdvisor. I don't know if you've been there lately, but if you haven't, check it out. It looks really nice. Uh, we, we picked a new green. It's, it's uh, much more streamlined and modern. Uh, it really helps you get what you want um, a bit more quickly. And it's also beautiful. It's very photocentric. We're taking advantage of all those uh, user photos and professional photos to uh, make uh, planning your travel pretty, even if you're just daydreaming, right? So uh, part of this photocentric um, design means we have shelves. So kind of like when you're using Netflix and you see shelves of, of movies that you're going through and they're all kind of tailored to you, we're doing the same thing with restaurants and hotels and attractions. So you see uh, related to items you viewed, hotels with great views, um, uh, hotels with particular amenities that you've uh, mentioned that you care about, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then when you click on a particular restaurant or hotel or attraction, um, you get lots of photos. You get this nice uh, um, photo slideshow thing to go through. It's all just very immersive. So that, that's great, right? But one of the things that we discovered uh, immediately when we launched is that um, we often show really nice photos, uh, but occasionally we show photos that are not great. Now, you know, if we, if we kind of like buried these somewhere, then, then that would be fine. But in these cases, these were all like the big hero photo of a restaurant or like the thumbnail in the, uh, the shelf that you saw. So uh, the machine learning team, even though none of us are really uh, computer vision people, uh, we wanted to figure out, can we, can we do better than this? Um, similarly, you know, we have these amenity specific shelves, so like beachfront hotels in Cancun or hotels with a pool in San Francisco. But then we show just the sort of the normal hero photo 
of the place. And you know, sometimes we actually get it right and we show a beach for beachfront or a pool for the pool, but often we just show the bedroom. Well, that's not very, very helpful. If, if actually what you care about is the pool, why don't we show the darn pools, right? Well, we can't exactly have you know, humans sit down and label 150 million. It just doesn't scale well. And actually, humans don't do a super great job at it anyway. So um, this presented an opportunity. Um, so the, the other thing is uh, photo ordering. So when you click on the details for a place and you see all the, the photos, the ordering that we do right now is not really, um, it's, it's not super savvy. So, so here are a couple of fairly popular places. This is the Four Bubble Hotel in Cancun. It's got 6,000 plus reviews. This is the number six hotel in Atlantic City. And when you go to look at their photos, these are the first ones that you see. This is your first impression is a dirty cup with like cigarettes in it. And, uh, or, you know, a picture of people's family or whatever. And, you know, okay. So the, the photos of people's family, that's not very helpful to anyone. The, the photo of the cup with the cigarette, um, that's actually helpful in a certain context, right? So if you've got a negative review and you say the place is filthy and you want to provide evidence, in the context of that review, that's really helpful. But as the first impression for the number six hotel in Atlantic City, I don't think that's actually representative, right? So, you know, we can do better than this. Okay. So what do we want to do? We want to select the hero photo, like the big photo when you first go on the detail page. We want that to be better. Um, and we want it to be better even in situations where we don't have an active owner selecting a good place. Because we have a lot of sort of long tail uh, markets where you don't have uh, active owner engagement. And we really have to pick a photo for them. Uh, when we have a, an amenity shelf, we want to show their relevant amenity, whether it's pool or beach or, or spa or, or fitness center. And when we show um, the photos for a place, the default sort order should not just be like reverse chronological or something, you know, random. It should be, you know, something that is useful and uh, preferably uh, pleasing to the eye. Okay. So uh, I'm going to first talk about our approach and then show some results. And then uh, depending on time, we can go into a little bit of the detail of uh, what we learned from the whole process. So our approach, 15 interns, a mini fridge of GPUs, and great open source software. So uh, to uh, do all of this work, we first needed um, a fair amount of training data, right? Uh, we just happened to have 15 high school interns uh, for the summer, uh, most of whom were uh, the kids of employees. Uh, and they were already doing some photo work anyway. They were doing photo moderation, sort of making sure that uh, there's no inappropriate photos. And so they were, they were more than happy to go and do something uh, a little bit different. So uh, the first thing they did is some pairwise ranking. So we gave them 200,000 photo pairs. And seriously, they got through 200,000 in like a week. These, these kids are monsters. Um, and uh, I basically just gave them for each uh, restaurant or each hotel two random photos from that uh, property and said, uh, which one makes you want to learn more about the place? Which one, uh, I, I didn't actually use the word attractive, just said, which motivates you to click? So uh, they had a very simple uh, GUI here where they click on one, you get the little green outline, and they just go through them 500 at a time, hit submit, grab the next 500 batch, go through. Um, we also had them uh, label whether photos contained humans or not. Um, we tried grabbing uh, external data sets um, to do this, um, but the like ImageNet is not necessarily representative of what TripAdvisor has. So when we tried to train on that, we ended up getting um, too many things that were, uh, we, we got way too many false negatives because it was, it, it somehow learned that a human is someone in a bikini on a beach. And so uh, a bunch of people in a restaurant, not human. A, a, a bikini person on a beach, yes, human. Just a beach, yes, human. That's the problem. Like, you can't tell the deep learning, ignore the rest of the scene, just focus on the thing I want. So instead, we had them label our data so it was a little bit more representative. Uh, next, we had them label photos by uh, scene type. Um, so for hotels, we had a certain set of um, classes, and then for restaurants, we had a different class. And uh, our infrastructure for collecting the data was really simple. You don't have to go crazy. Like, this was uh, Python and Pandas to, uh, to munge the data, HTML and JavaScript to, to feed this form here, 
and then a really simple cherry pie uh, Python uh, web server to receive the like the CSV uploads. So like you know I wrote this in an afternoon. Like you don't need something crazy. Okay, feature space. So um, when you start to uh, read up on deep learning, um, a lot of the tutorials start with like, okay, we're going to make a convolutional neural network and you're going to start with your images and you're just going to train it from scratch. Uh, but what we found is that it's, it's really much better to take some of one of the industry leading pre-trained networks that exists out there that's been trained on millions and millions and millions of images and actually use um, a section of it for your problem, right? So we took, there's a, a network called uh, ResNet or ResNet 50 for 50 layers. It's a 50 layer convolution, convolutional neural network. It was trained on uh, ImageNet data with had a thousand classes. Um, takes a lot of horsepower to train that up to find uh, exactly the, the right network. But when it's all trained and wins its uh, competitions and stuff like that, you can actually lop off the top part of the network that's concerned with that particular classification. And what you have in the bottom half is a really good feature extractor, right? So you can basically uh, take that, that sub part of the network, feed your images into it, it does all the convolutions, um, and what you get out is 2048 uh, what are called bottleneck features. So this is, you know, if you think of a bottleneck, right, so you've got uh, a lot of convolutions and expansions, and then there's a point where it kind of contracts down to this 2048 feature space, and then it might come back out, but those features, like, capture, like, the essence of the images. And we found that they're actually really useful for a wide range of problems, and not even just classification. So, um, so for the uh, trying to figure out um, which should be the best photo to show as the hero photo, uh, we used an architecture called uh, a Siamese network. So this is basically where you take two multi-layer feed-forward networks and you actually pair them together. So that's the, the diagram on the side here. Um, so the trick with Siamese networks is that the, the different layers actually share weights. They're not different weights. And what you're learning is to maximize the difference between the output for the better image versus the worst image. So every time the high school student said, this one's better than this one, the better one went on the left, the worst one went on the right, and then you'd use backprop and gradient descent to maximize the difference. And um, so people have used this uh, for a lot of different um, ranking problems. Um, and uh, it, it surprisingly comes out really well, even for something as subjective as like which, which image was better. And the multi-layer perceptron stuff or the multi-layer feed-forward network is uh, pretty standard Keras stuff. So it's basically just a dense layer uh, interleaved with uh, dropout layers. And um, I won't go into details of what those are. You can Google those pretty easily. Um, but I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't take a whole lot of Keras code, um, and then there's just some pretty simple stuff on top of that to do the Siamese network. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to, to get going. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty cool. Um, thinking back to like some of the early releases of TensorFlow, where it was really hard to know what you were doing. Now it's pretty easy. Yeah. Because uh, you're presenting different inputs. That's right, that's right, exactly. So, what's the control? So basically we had those uh, high school students label pairs, right? So you always had a good and a bad, right? So you do the good on one side, the bad on the other. But when you go into production, you can actually get rid of the right-hand side because all you need is the scalar output because they're the same weights, right? When you go, when you go into testing, you're right, they are exactly just, you know, the flip of each other, yep. Yep. Um, okay, so training and evaluation. Um, so this is a quick photo of our little mini fridge. It's just a, a machine that's about the size of a mini fridge, so that's what we call it, Kenmore. Um, but it, it, it's, you know, as, as much heat as it produces, it's actually not that big a machine. It's got a couple of consumer grade GPUs in it uh, and a fair amount of RAM. Um, so you, you pair that up with Keras and TensorFlow and Pandas. And you actually have a pretty good machine for doing the development grade stuff. So training your models, evaluating them, 
uh, generating enough data to do some, some testing and, and so on. Um, so, you know, how, how fast is it? So to, to train that pairwise network takes maybe 20 minutes. Uh, to do a random hyperparameter search, maybe you run it overnight and you get some good, good parameters. So it's, it's really pretty fast. I, I recommend if you're doing deep learning stuff, get the GPUs, even if you're getting one that's a generation or two back in consumer grade, because it's still so much faster than, than your CPUs. Uh, and then for evaluation, you know, obviously we do cross-validation for figuring out whether we have any kind of signal at all. And then uh, we very quickly go into A-B testing. So example for the um, uh, swapping out the, um, the thumbnail or the hero image for a restaurant, half of our users saw the machine vision selected photo and half saw whatever we had before and then we saw what the, what the difference was. So uh, because we had such good results, we were, we were um, pretty confident to do a 50% slice. Most of our tests are more in the like the 4% range. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, if, if people couldn't hear, the, the question was, uh, does it make sense to build a mini fridge or does it make sense to um, spin up one of these AWS GPU enabled instances? Um, and it really depends on your situation, right? So if you're just um, kind of getting your feet wet, you don't know whether you're gonna commit to this stuff, um, spinning up an AWS instance is just much, much easier. Um, if your um, institution is already kind of married to AWS and it makes sense to be in that ecosystem, then great. But the minute you start doing anything at scale, um, the mini fridge ends up being cheaper. And if you need more uh, drive space, you throw it in there. It's not all the way in S3 somewhere. And if you need more RAM, you, you throw it in there and it's just, it's just a lot cheaper. The downside is now you have a mini fridge to maintain, right? So um, uh, at, at um, TripAdvisor, we've uh, tended to favor the route of doing things uh, in-house, but only when it's cost effective. And it's one of those places where we also happen to have people who like to play with hardware. So <laughs> Uh, I think it's a little bit of both, um, so I'll talk about that a bit uh, when I show the results because that'll be a better context. Okay. So, so this is where we did kind of all the training and evaluation, but um, to try to um, do all the processing of our 150 million photos on, on this thing is not great, and even, even if we did move it all on there, then we wouldn't have any resource to do our uh, research and development, right? So. Um, to do our deployment and kind of like uh, running stuff at scale. So we already have a Kubernetes cluster in, um, uh, in house. Uh, does anyone, everyone know what Kubernetes is? So Kubernetes, it's like, it's like AWS, but you're kind of running it yourself. It's, it's built on some uh, uh, Google um, in house uh, uh, system called, what's that? Yeah, uh, Docker is actually part of Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes will let you spawn a bunch of Docker containers, right? So we do this for our log processing, we do this for our microservices, and so it kind of sen made sense to uh, put in a couple of nodes in this cluster that had um, GPUs in it, and now whatever team needs some GPU resource, um, they're, they're able to get it. So uh, we got a couple of nodes with a, a bunch of um, NVIDIA 1080 Ti. So again, this is consumer grade, a little bit newer, a little bit fancier, um, but at one point we're doing the analysis to figure out, well, do we go with the expensive sort of um, professional grade GPUs that are, have been designed for deep learning, or do you go with the thing that's designed to be in, you know, the, the basement of your mom's house playing video games? Um, and we found that actually the, the consumer grade one does great for our scale. Our scale is 150 million. I mean, it's not, it's not Facebook, but it's not tiny either. Um, but, you know, it, it, it does great. So when you're thinking of, like, cost effectiveness, this is pretty good, and it's, it's certainly way cheaper than AWS. So we basically had um, the Kubernetes cluster for computation, and then on storage, we have a, a, a Yarn cluster um, that we run uh, Spark on top of. So basically, uh, we have a pipeline that gets um, the, the URLs of our different photos as a PySpark data frame, uh, splits it into partitions, and then each partition, it will um, grab the images themselves from our CDN, calculate the stats, calculate those bottleneck features, 
calculate the outputs from the different models that we've built on top of those bottleneck features and then write it back out to, um, to, to Hive. Um, and um, uh, from Hive, you can then build whatever application you need on top of that. So if you want to fix the sort order, that would be something that runs on top of Hive. If you want to uh, fix the amenity shelves, that would be on top of Hive, but all the model output is, is there and you don't have to worry about this side of it. Okay, so that was the approach. Here's the results. Uh, spoiler alert, it's pretty food and fewer bathrooms. Uh, on the restaurant side, so um, the top row is uh, what we had uh, previously and the bottom row is what the uh, machine vision selected. Um, so, you know, as much as I love this, this cute older couple, uh, we go with the fancy dessert instead. Um, we have a lot of restaurant owners that are very happy with the the sign or the logo that they paid a lot of money to, to have made and so they want that to be the big thing but we find that actually people like to see the ambiance or the food they, they, they don't really need your need your logo and um, and then of course on, on the on the end why that ever became the, the thumbnail in the first place I'm not sure but you know we replace it with some food so you don't always get to have huge jumps in quality because some places they just don't have a lot of quality photos um, but in many cases, you do get to have a jump. So, you know, we're talking about maybe 300,000 restaurants. We had a, a nice big gain that, that, we, that we we're interested in. So, so to get back to your question, um, w there, it's definitely glomming on to some low-level aspects like sharpness, resolution, um, that kind of stuff. And it's pretty clear when you look at some of the places, things that it replaced. Um, but it's also looking for um, some things that are a little bit more uh, high level. Like uh, we noticed when we we're looking at the, the raw training data that the high school students definitely preferred food over ambiance, uh, which is something we still need to vet whether our travelers feel the same way. But um, this definitely preferred food over ambiance as well. So it's doing that kind of level of like, am I looking at a plate? Am I looking at, you know, things from afar, things up close and that, that kind of thing. So. It doesn't always pick food. I mean, the, the, the one in the middle is a, a, a good example. Um, but in all of our testing, I mean, I, I think I personally looked through maybe two or 300 different swaps, and I think I found one that I didn't agree with. So it's pretty good. Yeah. Yep, yep, uh, good question. So, so the question was, uh, when we did A-B testing, so we, sh we showed them, we showed half of our users the top um, and then um, half of our users the bottom. And what did we measure? We measured um, how often when they saw that photo on a, like a search result page, how often did they click on it versus when uh, before, how often did they book, uh, how often um, did they, how long did they stay on the site, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, we're still gathering data. It looks pretty good. It looks like, you know, click-through rate is probably up maybe 3% for restaurants. We're still doing hotels. We're kind of, you know, we make more money on hotels and we have more signals from hotels because there's more, you know, more direct booking of hotels through TripAdvisor. So uh, we're, we're anxious to see how much it impacts uh, that. Because, you know, if you see, so like, actually that's a good segue. So if you see as, as the thumbnail for a hotel, the the toilet, right? Um, you might not ever click on it, and so you don't find out that that's actually the perfect hotel for you, and so that you end up, you know, maybe booking another place or maybe not booking anything, and, and you bounce off. So if you saw instead the really nice pool that they have, hey, you know, maybe maybe you would actually click and, and, and look more. So you know, I personally like the lizard, but I think seeing that it has a, a nice uh, facade might be a bit better. And and then and then the last one, you know, you've got kind of a, you know. The skylight was probably nice at one point, but it looks like it needs to be cleaned. Whereas, you know, at the bottom, again, you know, this is not uh, a super fancy place, but it's fancy in, in the decor and everything. And it looks, I, I don't know, I'd love to click and, and see more. And, and, you know, these, these are photos from all around the world. These are photos from high-end places and very uh, uh, down market places. So you kind of, you, you see the, the gamut. Okay, so that was the um, results from doing our, our swapping of the, the hero photo. Um, so now I'm going to show a little bit about um, 
uh, hotels with a pool. So, you know, when we recommend you hotels with a pool, wouldn't you like to see the pool? So, uh, here's uh, one example hotel uh, on the top. Uh, oh, sorry, not hotel. This is an example shelf. So, each one of these photos is from a different hotel, all in the same uh, city, and they all have a pool, but you don't actually see the pool on any of them. I mean, they look nice enough, but it's not going to tell you anything about the pool. So in the, in the bottom, what we do is we find the pooliest, uh, most attractive photo. So pooliest meaning like we have a uh, scene type classifier, so the one that has the, the highest um, probability of being a pool, and then also um, on the attractiveness ranking or the pairwise ranking, which one's highest. And so if something's not attractive enough or not pooly enough, we won't, we'll just use the regular thumbnail because it's better to show a really nice picture of the bed than a really ugly picture of the pool. Um, and similarly, if their hero thumb is already a pool, we're, we're going to keep using that. So, um, um, so, so basically, you actually get a chance to, to look at the thing that you essentially care about. Uh, same thing with, uh, with beachfronts. Um, so these all have beachfronts, but you can't see them now. And uh, when we get this into production, you'll actually get to, to see the, the beaches. Um, so that was a fun, fun. Those are our two most popular shelves. We'll just kind of work down to the, the lesser popular ones as, as we have uh, time and priority. Uh, so last thing, uh, I talked about uh, sort order really mattering, uh, wanting to make sure that we show the most useful, most attractive photos first. Um, here's one uh, hotel uh, in the red outline. This is the current sort order. So you've got like the beach kind of on an angle. You've got some, you know, not so great photos. Uh, at the bottom, we uh, sort so that you get professional photos first, attractive photos first, photos without people first, um, photos that are attached to um, uh, reviews that were not like a one bubble. Not that those photos with one bubble are not useful, but they're, better, they're more useful in the context of that negative review where they're talking about it and not necessarily in your, your first impression. So here you're getting kind of a nicer, uh, a nicer uh, view of the place and kind of a better um, sort of thing. So we're not actually hiding any photos. We're just sort of presenting them in a different order. Um, same thing here. So the, uh, the current sort order, it's, you know, it's not terrible. I mean, especially if you, you take into account that they're, uh, they're just a traveler taking photos. So sometimes they're not really well lit. Um, sometimes they're a little bit uh, duplicative. Um, so at the bottom, I instead we have the, the better sort order where you kind of get a better feel for the place. And, um, so this is our, our, our first hack at it. Um, it's good enough to do some A-B testing. Uh, we want to do a little bit more. So for example, uh, we want to experiment with um, are there different orders that we should put the scene types? Do people generally like to see the beds first and then uh, the bar next or so on? Do they want to have a little bit more uh, variety where you interleave those things? Um, what do we do about photos that are really similar to each other? Do we kind of spread them apart? You know, all those different things. So um, that, that's kind of the, the, uh, all the results. How are we doing on time? Because I can either shut up or, or keep going. The 702. Okay, all right. Well, so this is, this is one of my wrap-up slides. So the, this meetup is all about uh, doing deep learning in, in production. Um, so I imagine a lot of you are interested in uh, you know, how do I scale this thing? How do I work it into, into my pipeline? So I wanted to give you a, a few pieces of uh, a advice from our somewhat limited experience, right? So uh, first thing I mentioned before, you don't need a fancy infrastructure for, for collecting labels. I just wrote a bit of HTML, um, spun up a Python web server on my dev box, and that was it. So um, pretty easy. That said, if you're collecting labels on Mechanical Turk, they have some great um, tools there. So if you don't have the benefit of a bunch of high school interns, I recommend Mechanical Turk because not only do you have a lot of people who can do stuff quickly, but, um, but they also have some nice tooling too. Um, depending on what you're doing, try using these bottleneck features, not necessarily from ResNet 50, but from, from any of the existing convolutional neural networks rather than building one from scratch. Now, if you're doing, like, if you're looking at images from, like, um, cancer screenings or whatever, maybe it's worth doing the whole CNN. Uh, but if you were doing, like, regular photography, the kind of stuff that would benefit from uh, something that's been trained on normal photos like ImageNet, use one of those 
pre-built models and, and take their bottleneck features. I mean, we've shown, not only does it do great on regular classification thing, I mean, like our, our thing for classifying restaurant scene type only had 50,000 photos and it gets 97% accurate. It's scary, it's really good. Um, the uh, pairwise stuff, we had um, 150,000 for restaurant and 50,000 for hotel and it, and it did great enough to roll out. So, um, um, so try it because you're benefiting from, from all that hard work. Uh, if you're running your deep learning stuff in Python, actually, regardless of where you're running your deep learning stuff, um, got, got to use GPUs. They're just so much faster. And I recommend uh, multiprocessing. Um, so, so one of the things you'll find with GPUs is that sometimes, depending on what you're doing, they're so fast that like you don't get data into them fast enough. So what you really want to do is have uh, multiple threads feeding it data at the same time and that way it can always keep its pipeline. Um, so like if you don't see the GPU pegged at 100%, you're not using it all. So um, in, in Java, this is, this is pretty easy. In Python, you need to use multi-processing, not multi-threading. Um, but you know, even just three or four threads will, will keep it happy. Um, you know, depending on where you're getting your image data, in, in our case, I'm actually hitting our production CDN, um, the content delivery network. It's like where you get your photos and stuff. Um, uh, sometimes those have uh, high latency, but they'll let you have a lot of threads. So, you know, use, use a bunch of threads so that you get that data pipeline um, full. Um, one thing that we found, not just with deep learning, but generally, uh, keep your training pipeline uh, at the same code quality and reproducibility as your production pipeline. It's very, um, very common to make a mistake where you're, um, you're, you're hacking around trying to get something to work. It finally works and you're like, oh great, okay, I'll just take this model binary and I'll ship it out and if we ever need to retrain it, I'd have to go back and figure out how I did it. No, it's good to have one of your products from the research to be the, the training pipeline, how to go from the labeled data to the built model in case Keras makes a breaking change to their versions, for example, or, or whatever, you want to be able to, to retrain it. Um, on a similar vein, uh, if you're using Python, use something like uh, virtual env or conda in environments to keep your environment stable. So this will basically let you specify exactly what uh, versions of the different packages you want and not mess with the one that's being used for, for other things. You kind of have it all in one place. Um, uh, one of the things that I'd like to investigate more is the distributed GPU platform. So uh, TensorFlow can run now on multiple machines. Um, there are uh, plugins for Spark that will let you distribute GPU work over multiple GPU machines. Um, that's not what we're doing here. We're using Spark as the feed in and feed out to our local GPU computation. And Spark doesn't really like to work that way. And so especially if you have multiple GPU machines and that kind of scale and you already have a distributed platform, I, I would look into those as they mature because it might, might be the better route. Um, and that's kind of related. Uh, I, Spark you know, really wants to be in charge of computation where you do all the computation on the, the nodes in the cluster and then it brings it all back together. I kind of had to do nasty things to get it to feed all of the stuff locally to do the computation and then to push it back into, into the cluster. It would have been nice to have those GPU nodes be part of the cluster themselves and have Spark manage it. Um, either it's not there yet or I'm not there yet, I don't know which, but, um, but you know, if I were to do it again, I might, might consider uh, more of a distributed platform. Okay, uh, quick acknowledgements. Uh, so uh, Jeff Palmucci and Aaron Gonzalez did a lot of the uh, early work for this. Um, uh, Ani Wang and Tyler O'Brien have been sort of my partners in the trenches getting all this stuff working. And uh, none of this would have been possible without uh, all the great work that these different institutions have, have, um, have put in, both in terms of open sourcing software and models, doing some of the original research, um, and competing with each other, and, and TripAdvisor gets, gets all the, the benefit from it. So, um, you know, it, I, I can't not acknowledge them. Um, okay, I, I think I'm, I'm uh, good now. Uh, any, any questions? Any further questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the, the pairs that we presented with the high school interns were random from the same restaurant. So you'd see two photos from the same restaurant and they'd have to pick which one's better. And then the deep learning had to somehow learn what the high school students were, were coming up with. And um, I haven't dug down to figure out in more detail exactly what it's climbing onto. All I know is that it did what I wanted it to, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question, and, and that's actually uh, one thing that we're going to look into next, right? So, uh, you know, what are they clicking at? Uh, also, you know, when you show them a bunch of photos and they skip over 10 and click one, does that mean that that one is somehow more useful than the 10 before it, right? You could make that kind of assumption. Uh, one of the challenges with that is at uh, in, in any given restaurant or hotel, we might not have a lot of clicks. You know, we've got um, seven million different properties and a lot of the clicks go to the really big places and then there's some places that get very few clicks. Um, so I think we would have to find some way to um, have that learning be, be fairly uh, uh, broad across those things so that we can, we can make it work. Um, but yeah, we've definitely been thinking about, about that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've, we've thought about it a bit. Um, we've also thought about that on the text analysis side as well. So when someone writes a review that's really similar to a thousand other reviews and say, eh, do you really want to? Or like, you know, do some sort of like um, information theory analysis on the review and say this doesn't actually have any useful content, but we could do that on, on the, the photos as well. Um, it's, it's tricky because uh, if, you, if you're an end user and you uh, get a signal from us that we think your photo isn't helpful, um, you know, maybe that means you're not going to uh, submit it. And maybe now you're a little disenfranchised. Uh, maybe that photo would have been useful to someone. Just, you know, just our machine vision didn't think it was, I don't know, it makes me nervous. You know, one, one thing we could do though is say, all right, w one problem that a lot of people uh, have is they'll get on the TripAdvisor app and they'll just give us their whole freaking photo album and it's not helpful, right? So if our app were to say, hey, okay, you just gave us 100 photos, I think these 20 are great. Do you want to just focus on those 20? And people might say yes, that, that would be really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. I thought I saw another hand, but yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so uh, there's not only a bias in their, their age, but these are also, you know, kids from, from Wellesley. So there's like a demographic issue. There's obviously an American issue and we have geos like, you know, points of sale all over the world. Um, and there's also the fact that like, well, if you're, if you're looking at restaurants for three or four days ahead and it's kind of an upscale restaurant, you might be caring more about the ambiance. If you're in destination right now looking at restaurants um, on your phone, you may be hungry and care more about the food, right? So the context matters as well. Uh, but yeah, we did worry about that and that's why we did a lot of um, sort of manual vetting of the, the, both the training data and the, the built model to, to make sure that that wasn't like an overwhelming problem. So when people use Mechanical Turk, that's also an issue. Turkers aren't necessarily representative of like a business traveler in Paris or whatever. Um, but so I think this is where looking at the, the click-through traffic as a training signal might be better because that would be fully representative of our, of our users. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the other issue that we had with uh, collecting the data is that often the, um, the quality uh, varied a lot. So we had um, batches of 500 and so what I would do is I'd train a model and then see uh, what batches disagreed with the model the most. Right, so you'd have most of the batches at like, you know, 84, 85%, and then you'd have some at like chance accuracy. And so you say, all right, well, there's basically no signal. And then I'd visually verify that, you know, they're just, they're not really in the game, <laughs> so to speak. So I'd drop those out. So I think, you know, if you're using Mechanical Turk or anyone, you really want to uh, vet the data and not um, take for granted that people are going to be at 
you know, top performance all the time, especially if they're doing 200,000 photos, you get fatigue. Yeah. You, yeah, last question, sure, great. Go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. So we tend not to try to sell or, or monetize our technology. We tend to use it to improve our site, and then then we do things like this to kind of share it. Um, so uh, that said, who knows? I'm not in charge of those things. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. I'll take a question later. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Right back. So different topic. Different topic. So my name for for anyone who wants to know how to pronounce it is Ayla. The spelling is terrible, but it's my English teacher from second grade, so that's how it's like. Once you put it on the document, you don't change it. Um, I'm the founder of Real Research. I'm also a product manager and researcher at the Mass General Hospital and the Broad Institute. That's how it works in the academic area. And the meetup organizer. My previous background is at the software high tech industry and entrepreneurship. In the last few years, I shifted my career path to the biology and bioinformatics field. I worked as a technician, actually doing wet lab uh, at the Whitehead uh, Institute. And then I work on the analysis side at the board. I'm here today to discuss the challenges of machine learning uh, for better care, healthcare, very related to what Gore said about. And these are the things that I'm currently working on at Oriel Research Venture. So the part that I know by heart is this. So I'll talk a little bit about the motivation to use machine learning at a uh, at the healthcare industry, and based on that, on the goals. Um, for the people that are not foundation medicine people, uh, what, is the, what is precision medicine? The data challenges that we have, go touch it this a little bit. Why machine learning? And few models that are, the workflow models that currently being considered, potential solutions for these challenges, and what is our real research? So on one side, what we have right now is a um, technology that is able to kill cells, sick cells, selectively. Uh, for people who are familiar a little bit with this field, edit genes at the body, like CRISPR for people from foundation, and selectively inhibiting protein in the body for cells that are sick based on mutation or, or different markers that we can see. And the big thing about that, it's not about each one of these drugs, it's about the being, the, this being extendable. That once we know what the target is, then we can use these technologies to kill other, or to, to treat other diseases. On the other hand, we have the healthcare industry who suffers from uh, diagnostic errors. Many times I would find people, cancer is a very, it's more um, uh, using genomics more frequently, but this is basically not about cancer. We can. Uh, repurposes for every disease that has uh, features that can be used. And uh, in rare diseases, there are also in cancer, there are many cases when we don't have diagnos uh, precise diagnosis for the patient. We still don't know what is the best target for the patient from different reasons. And we have a limited data-driven medical decision. So we do have people sharing the data, building protocols based on data, but we it's very limited, clinical trials are very small. We're trying now to go larger to a larger clinical trial, but we are not there yet. So the question that we are asking, how can we merge technology, amazing technology that we currently have with healthcare challenges and for the patient benefit, of course. And based on that, our goals will be to improve care across diseases. And better care, we mean data-driven diagnostics, data-driven uh, therapy matching, and drug development. 
So all these features that we find basically is potential targets. So precision medicine, for people who are not familiar with precision medicine, we see here a melanoma patient is very um, famous picture in the, in the medical uh, field. We, we see here a patient with melanoma, many lesions on his body, in his body. Melanoma is a skin cancer. And uh, he, he was uh, lucky to have um, a BRAF mutation. BRAF is a gene on the genome specific location, the specific area, coding areas, but it doesn't really matter. A, sel a selective marker that we can hit when we, when we treat this patient. And luckily, this patient was sensitive to this drug, to the BRAF inhibitor, because having this specific V600E mutation doesn't mean that you're going to respond for that. And uh, after a few weeks of treatment, he, was, he looked like this, the picture on the right side with no lesions in his body. And this is quite amazing without using any chemotherapy and with relatively a patient that's feeling relatively well. However, this is not relevant for all melanoma patients. This specific patient developed resistance to this therapy, so it was not the end of the story for him. And um, we purposed uh, this drug for, uh, for, other, uh, for other cancers. For example, colon cancer is not straightforward. And, and we asked ourselves, how can we extend this temporary success for other uh, treatments? And the answer is in the data. That's where machine learning comes to play. In some ways, in a very simplified way, this is we want to start from D1 diagnostic and get into a cure, another destination. We want to know how, what are the paths, what are the treatments that we want, or what are the stations that we need to go on the way. So what are the data challenges? And I'll give you one example of data in this field. Very, very dramatically different from the industry, for someone who came from the industry. So the goal is to let the data tell the story. And then we have many feature categories. Omics is a family of uh, many, many uh, categories, DNA, RNA, uh, proteomics, epigenomics, Metabolism, I'll show you a few of them. Tons of features. Clinical data. For DNA, for example, 2% of the DNA is 20,000 coding uh, gene coding areas. And, uh, and the another 98% is things that we want to use for, uh, for, uh, for, for machine learning. And each one of them has endless variation. Not endless, but millions of variants, variants, uh, values. Um, we have many values. We have different types of data. Sometimes it's continuous. Sometimes it's uh, discrete. Sometimes it's sparse. Sometimes it's um, uh, anything that you can think. Clinical could be a text that you need to categorize. Um, hospitals, are, hospitals that are generating, generating very limited data. Most of the data is missing. We have conflict between uh, um, um, assays that are done in different hospitals, even for the same patient. We, had, uh, we have a wide ver variety of techniques. Now there is, everybody's talking about single cell. It's uh, about taking one cell and, and sequencing its DNA or RNA. Uh, in, the, in the past, we used to do it, or still doing it very, uh, from most, most of the places, as a batch. You take a piece of the tumor or tissue or a disease and, and you sequence it. Uh, there is no data formatting standard. Nothing at all. Everybody is generating his, standard, his data in a different standard. And we don't know what is a normal, because the cell, based on its purpose, different, ex different uh, activity, different exp ex expression, different usage of the gene. And of course, therapy, if someone was taking drug X, Y, and Z, and the other one was taking Y, X, and Z, does it mean that it is the same therapy? How we define that? And then we get, get even a larger matrix of options and, uh, and, and paths. Another uh, challenge that we have at, the, at this, kind of, uh, this field is uh, that not everybody is generating data that is, uh, uh, can be used for machine learning, like genomics or other omics. Uh, patient privacy protection is a huge challenge. Even the data that we have, we have to go into HIPAA and IRB, many institutes that are 
uh, trying to save the patient and provide science uh, tools to work, but this is a very contradiction, contradicting. And we have the academic credit barriers. A lot of the people need to publish. This is the academic rewarding system, and for that, they keep the data close to themselves, and it's hard to share the data. Example of data in this foundation medicine example, no privacy uh, protection issue. And so that's the kind of report that foundation medicine is uh, providing. There is more to it, but basically it's the names of the genes and mutations that they are harboring. On the other side, 23andMe with some kind of clinical information. We don't need to understand exactly what is happening inside, but, but, but it's not the same format. It's not that we can uh, push it to the same, to the same training uh, model and, and find and easily. There's a lot of pre-processing work to be done here. So why machine learning? So the cell processes are very complex and convoluted. A Tmap is peanuts for the cell. Cell is very convoluted. There are many connections being done there, many regulations maybe uh, that are, uh, that are uh, affecting each other. And if we let the, the basic biology people try to, to find out uh, all these cell processes and their relations, it's gonna be long time, years, maybe decades, maybe more. So we're trying to get uh, insight from machine learning with a little understanding of, or less understanding of what is happening in the cell and maximize this uh, information for the patient uh, care. One insight is able to change many people's lives because once you find one feature that can help us, then there are many people that you can treat it that way. So one, uh, one model workflow that I'm currently working on, but I'm not sure, I'm gonna show you that next time that I'm gonna present, but it's too early, is the diagnostic prediction model. So basically saying who is sick, who is healthy, you can also derive some markers and target candidates based on that. So I'm trying, you know, if someone can stop me if I'm not simplifying it enough. So we have the patient with all this data, with all these features that are super, super uh, long, uh, long list, and the clinical information, and we want to know if he's sick or not, not only cancer. So this is, a little bit about the feature. We have the DNA that is the genomic feature, the RNA is for transcription, but it really doesn't matter. It just, each one of them is a science by itself. And then we have the training data matrix that is the molecular and clinical information, the patient, and then we want to predict if it's sick or healthy. If you notice, there is no a notion of disease here. We, um, in my view, and I think someone, you know, some people will agree with me. We don't know the labels of disease or all diseases right now. And we can say that if someone was diagnosed with one disease, maybe a breast cancer might be a subset of a breast cancer. If it's a colonorectal cancer, it can be a subset. But it's not only cancer, other diseases also. So if I don't know the right labels, I cannot train the data based on these labels. So going from a training data for sick and healthy was making sense more here, and I'll talk about therapy and then you'll see maybe more sense uh, into it. And what, what can we use it for? For diagnostic tests based on blood or buccal smear or others that we, we know if someone is uh, sick or not. It is being used right now, such diagnostic tests, but not with such features for machine learning based on that for a response for therapy or for biopsies, but this is one of them. We can identify known and unknown ge genetic diseases because based on this feature, we can categorize new uh, categories of disease, use it for prenatal tests, disease pre uh, predisposition, and preventative medicine. And then there is the therapy matching prediction model that could also yield us which markers, target candidates, and therapy matching. So for that, there are two options here. One of them is pair therapy. Uh, look at the patient data and give type of response. If it's a cure, if it's a stable disease, I wanna know what is the uh, probability to get to each one of them, pair therapy. The other one was using all therapies, and then, uh, uh, and then the label is a set of the therapy and the response. Like therapy one could be, um, uh, 
the, the one drug, and then the response could be for cure, or this drug for a stable disease, and then it's T1, R2. In both models here, therapy, the, uh, the therapy definition it by itself is challenging. As, uh, sometimes, and most of the data right now that we have on genomics is the cancer, and in cancer there is a, a lot about the patient and a lot of evaluation before giving treatment, changing treatment, it's not so uh, straightforward. And there is no disease notion, because we believe that if therapy is responding uh, best for a specific set of features, minimal set of features, then we don't need to categorize the disease by that. We need to personalize also the identification of the disease. Okay, so the training model will look something like that, and the deliveries will be a specific therapy evaluation, drug development target, things that I already said. And for the second one, it's gonna be best therapy assignment. For the doctor, it's gonna look something like that. Maybe it makes more sense. Is this patient, what therapy info, info is available, and what is the probability for that to work with his uh, specific uh, feature information. Same, uh, same kind of, uh, uh, of uh, impl uh, impl implica uh, implications. The one thing that was not, we couldn't achieve, and the other one was drug repurposing for non and newly identified diseases. So if we see this is first time, we don't know what to do with that. Maybe it shares some common features with other diseases and we can use it in a more straightforward way. Of course, there is FDA, there's a lot of regulation behind it, but this is a shorter way than having someone to agree to investigate this specific disease. Okay, potential solutions for all these challenges with the data and with this specific area is use machine learning. What can you lose? Collaboration with pharma companies, hospitals, uh, DNA-based diagnostic facilities like Foundation Medicine. There is a huge uh, hype around IoT, Internet of Things, like Fitbit and others that are taking a lot of information, calling people in treatment and using their uh, personal smartphones. Um, data scientists, machine learners, bioinformatics, biologists, all of them need to gather together because there is a lot of sense of also knowing what is the drug and what are the features that are being used. Real research by itself is a, is a crowdsourcing project for uh, identifying all these uh, labels, challenges. Who is sick, why and what therapy will work best for him. It works on the Google Cloud Platform, uses TensorFlow. Anyone is welcome to contribute. Initial results are gonna be available and be shared soon. Something that I wanna push on this meetup is if someone wants to work on a a small group, uh, brainstorming, challenging, machine learning is new to many people, and there are new challenges coming in, and that's my, thank you. I think I made the time, if anyone has questions, and Shana Tova for anyone who is here.